Welcome to Bridge the Atlantic, where we get to know the people behind the creative industries and the advice they would share to their fellow creatives. We're your hosts, music web designer Ross Barber, owner of Electric Kiwi, where we create awesome custom websites for bands, artists, and musicians. I'm award-winning singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and indie filmmaker, Marcia Novelli. We're joined this week by author Elizabeth Dutton. Raised in California, Elizabeth has, br- has bridged the Atlantic in her own way by getting her master's in creative writing from the University of Glasgow, where she also started her first novel, Driftwood. In 2011, Skyhorse Publishing released her book, 1,033 Reasons to Smile, which has since been updated to 1,047 Reasons to Smile, and Elizabeth is currently working on poetry and a second novel. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, guys. How are you? I am well. Well, I actually am getting over a cold, as you can probably hear in my voice. But other than that, um, I'm well. Can't speak Good. for Ross, though. I'm, I'm doing pretty well. He's uh, hanging in there. Ross always, is hanging in there. It kills me when I hear that. But all right. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's get started uh, right away and uh, have you tell us three things about yourself that everyone should know. Uh, three things. Um, first of all, that... A lot of what I um, deal in and write with is sort of melancholy and bittersweet, but in real life, um, I rarely take things seriously, and I'm sort of goofy and an absolute um, fan of the absurd. And so um, there's a a difference between what I write and and who I really am. Um, Another thing would be that music um, is absolutely essential to my creative process. And so um, I was speaking with a friend recently who's an author, and he was talking about various um, types of music that he listens to, but that they don't have an impact on what he's writing. And um, the, the inverse is, is uh, true for me, that um, I establish playlists or I think of things that kind of um, line up with the tone of what I'm writing and, and listen to that while, while writing. Um, and then I guess a third thing is that one of my favorite parts about writing is, is research. I love going down the rabbit hole of things and I have a tendency to over-research what I'm writing so that um, I know more than what will appear in what I'm writing. And I feel like having that background knowledge in sort of subtly or subconsciously informs what I'm writing so that um, all that information is in there, even though it's maybe not available directly to the author, um, it just enriches the characters and the scenes. So those are three things. Well, that was thorough. You know what? I'm going to break those down so that your first, your first one there, uh, you talked about, you know, how your, your, your writing is a bit dark, but you're taking to yourself to be absurd and silly. I can very, very much relate to that. But I think that if you didn't have the outlet to let you know to express that darkness within you, you might not be that lighter, happy kind of bubbly person. You know what I right. mean? Right. And you know, and it, for me, it's an outlet. It gets it out. A, it's a definite <laughs> outlet, and I think that in some ways it can sometimes be a defense mechanism of not taking anything seriously. Um, but to have that outlet of letting the kind of um, darker side and the the bittersweet side of things, particularly the melancholy. Um, let's it out. You let it go. Well, you know, I always say that um, I don't take myself seriously, but I definitely take my art seriously. Exactly. You know, exactly. So it's not like you're just being frivolous with what you write. You know what I mean? Right. But, exactly. Um, yes. You, you yeah. Know, it's, you're not taking yourself seriously, and I think that's important. Right. The second thing you said, I think Ross and I were very happy to see that music is very important to you because that's a big part of the show. Uh, music and, and, and other art forms. So that's very interesting. Uh, do you do you need the music on? Not that you need it, or do you need it? Do you need music I on today? I do need music. I need music on a huh. daily basis. That um, music is such a huge part of my life. That um, growing up, uh, we it didn't necessarily come from a family of musicians, but um, music was ever present, and so um, and it wasn't sort of what you would call a typical sort of childhood of music. I came, I come from a really eccentric bohemian family. Um, my grandmother, uh, the story goes in the family, read years and years ago, my late grandmother, about this new artist, Bob Marley. And I think she read it like in the New York Times or the New York or something. And drove over an hour to a record store that would carry Bob Marley albums. And so we have all of these original vinyl Bob Marley albums. And she was just willing to sort of experiment with anything. 
um, and hear any kind of music. And so growing up, we had a really vast library of music from which to draw. Um, and then my brother um, is a musician, and so, and I kind of dabbled <laughs> playing music growing up. And so um, for me, particularly the lyricism of it, um, one of the concentrations that I have in um, my other sort of day job as a teacher is poetry. And I see such a direct connection there with, um, you know, poems and the lyricism of them that what really attracts me to a lot of music is the lyrics. And when you get that alchemy of beautiful lyrics and incredible music, it's so sublime. Um, it enriches your life, but then it also forces me to be more creative. Um, and it drives my creativity forward. And so, I mean, I just, it's like air. I couldn't live without music. There's just no way. Oh, I love to hear you say that. You know, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, I, I, I personally approach my songwriting, my, you know, my lyric writing as poetry, 100%. Uh, not everyone does, as you know. There's a lot of garbage out there. It's just words. It's just whatever. You know, it's, there's no art form to it. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that you, uh, that you love music as much as you do. And your third thing, remind me your third thing. Um, My third thing was about research. Yes, that yes, I can't, I can't, I can't relate to you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I think Roz can because he's the researcher for the show. But, yeah. Oh. It's, <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, oh. it's definitely but, beneficial to know more than, uh, than you're going to use because it just kind of gives you that deeper yeah. understanding, I, I think. I said that, you know, even for my lyrics, even when I write lyrics, I do do research, um, you know, for a certain metaphor I want to use or whatever. I really get to know what I, you know, I don't just... Yeah, so I could sure, maybe yeah. because I'm excited about it, I'll do it, but <laughs> overall I cannot relate to the well, loving research. <laughs> and what I find is that it sort of ties in with being like a lifelong <laughs> learner that, um, you know, just I, I can't get enough information and I never know what I'm going to add to my arsenal that may pop up later. And so um, you know as what? I kind when, of when absorb you, this. Sorry to jump in there, but you know what? Maybe it's the word research that scares me. Because when you say research, I think back to like high school, university, doing research projects. But you know, I do the same thing. I'm constantly reading and, and learning and learning every day. So maybe if we maybe if we just use the word um, just continuing it, Let's say absorbing. I think that that was absorbing reading. It's absorbing. the word. I'm like still like 14 inside. So like hearing the word research, like, no. Oh, I want to play See, I've, I've become <laughs> immune to it because I assign research papers all the time and my students just lose it. And what I've had to explain to them is that, you know, I don't really get a kick out of reading research papers. In fact, I would rather do anything else. I don't like <laughs> assigning them. I don't like reading them or grading them. Um, but the whole point is to, you know, develop life skills of being detail oriented yeah. and to search out information that you can't just Absolutely. take things at face value. Um, and so while I myself dreaded research papers growing up, I guess I have a different definition of research. I like this idea of absorbing information. Yes, absorbing um, sponges. Be a sponge. Exactly. And, that, but there, that's the, it plays that's, into that's the title things. of this episode, Be a this, Sponge. Be a sponge. <laughs> be a sponge. Uh, but not on other people. I, um, <laughs> I, one of the things in the, in the book, there's a, a scene where Clem, the main character, goes to the town of Walnut Grove, and I, I've been to Walnut Grove a couple times, and um, actually writing the book, my brother and I decided to drive the trip in the book just so that I had a, a fresher notion of what, what it was. Um, but I researched Walnut Grove so much, and I know that they had this opera house around the turn of the century that burned down, and that never shows up in the book. And I, for some reason, can't kind of shake that information, but it helped me understand the kind of spirit of the town. And so... Um, we should say, I, you're, talking about, you're talking about your book, Driftwood. Yeah, um, yeah. Which Ross and I have begun reading, and it's fantastic. So I, I really you. like it. Thank and you. I want, and I would not know about this book if I weren't for a certain actress named Emma Roberts, who happens to be a fan of yours. Uh, she was spotted yeah. with a, a copy of Driftwood, and she was uh, the paparazzi and everything, took photos for, I can't was it in, uh, what 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 uh, magazine was it in that you would know? Daily um, Mail. Daily Mail, yeah. So, publications. Um, that, must been, uh, that must have been, that must have been a real, that must have been a real It was um, the weirdest experience. day of my life, for many reasons. Um, my father last year um, had a stroke, and so he, it was that one of the kind of ramifications of it is he became really angry, this really angry guy. So I flew out to California to help my brother 
um, with his care and I had to drive him from the hospital where he was in Santa Cruz, California to an acute care facility we'd found in Oakland near my brother. And um, they're very strict about cell phone laws in California as well they should be. And so my phone, I was using as GPS and I had it on this little attachment to the dashboard. And the GPS is going along and my father's jonesing for a cigarette and yelling at me and just mad at the world. And I'm tuning him out and thinking, okay, this is not in, right, in, not in his right mind. Um, but my phone started making all these noises I'd never heard it make before. And he's yelling at the phone, what are these noises? And I just thought, okay, I just need to wait until I get him there and then I can check the phone. So I get him kind of situated in this acute care place and he's exhausted and he goes to sleep. And I open my phone and the first thing that comes up is, um, Emma Roberts is now following you on Twitter. And I thought, Emma Roberts, did I go to high school with someone named Emma Roberts? <laughs> and I was like, the name's ringing a bell, but I don't, you know, I'm, I'm old, I'm out of it. And so um, I Googled it and I was like, oh, wait a second, this is, this is different. And so then I started getting text after text after text of people saying, she's retweeted a photo of your book on Instagram and there are 60,000 likes. And all of this. I, I think of, actually, I think she posted a photo on her Instagram, yeah, and then just uh, tweeted that. And out. then tweeted I, it. I follow her on Instagram and Twitter actually, because I, I love uh, what she's done in American Horror Story. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I kind of, I'll just admit, I have a total crush on her. So <laughs> she's this, yeah, she's an so adorable sad. little thing. She's My so wife knows, cute. Okay. And she, uh, she was really sweet, and I kind of emailed back and forth with her for a bit. Um, what was I think she was sort of between American Horror Story and Scream Queens and really wasn't sure what she was going to do, but she fell in love with the book. Um, and so it was really a surreal to discuss my work with her. Um, what was odd were the various requests that I was getting on Twitter of, you know, can you please have her follow me? Can you send oh, her? Geez. And I thought, and I, I kind of felt nice being able to write back, I'm sorry, she's a fan of mine, and I just don't know her. <laughs> you know what, at the end of the day, she's a person, you know, you're yeah, a person, right? she just happens to be to be doing something that's more in the spotlight, um, you know what I mean, and I think, but that is very good, that is not just very good, that's very, very cool that, to be able to have someone that has such a following, be able to share some of your work, and share your work with a larger following. It made you know, a like, huge... Again, I said, hey, thanks, Emma, because, it were, you know, I wouldn't have, have uh, heard about you and I wouldn't start uh, reading your book and you wouldn't be on the show right now if it weren't for her. Thank so. you. Thank you, go. Emma. So there we go. Emma, your sweetheart. No, that's great, because, you know what, and, and she really doesn't have to, you know, share anyone else's work or anything No. Like that. And um, when you look at other celebrities so. who spend a lot of their time, you know, advertising whatever clothing they're wearing or... or she does plenty of that too, but that's okay. <laughs> but she puts a lot, I mean, she talks a lot about books, and I think that that's, yeah, that's I, important because, yeah. um, you know, not a lot of people focus on that, and she's constantly, if she finds a book that she likes, she talks and about she has, it. And she has a, I know she has a younger demographic fan base too, a lot of teenage girls. It's really good that, uh, you know, whether whether she's intentionally doing it or not, but she's promoting reading of actual books, actual <laughs> and books not magazines yeah. not you know blogs <laughs> and other things that not you know they Tumblr. all have a place but yeah but this is an actual book an actual story right. you know written by an actual writer so i think that's that's really cool yeah um, and i respect her immensely for that because she's she's actually plugged a number of books and and i appreciate that i think it's wonderful if you're watching this right now emma come on our show we'd love to talk yeah, to you come on emma get on the show um, it's amazing so uh, you also studied at the University of Glasgow. This is I where, did. Uh, this little weirdo is from. Yeah. <laughs> I say that affectionately. Our dear green place. <laughs> uh, what role do you find um, as a writer does education uh, place in enhancing and developing uh, one's craft? Um, what I found, you know, I had a long break between my undergrad and my graduate school. Um, I did my undergrad in California at the University of California, Davis, and I worked in a lot of really odd office jobs in between. And when I just couldn't take it anymore and thought I need to write and I need to focus, um, I found that the University of Glasgow offered me more of a writer's colony atmosphere than a classroom atmosphere. And to be able to work with other authors um, to really kind of understand 
uh, their methods and kind of hone my own craft. Um, the most important thing, quite honestly, um, is to is to read more. Um, that you can't improve your writing in any better way. Um, so education was really helpful um, in terms of not falling into a lot of, of cliches and being able to take risks. With Driftwood, I took a huge risk by making a main character who's not outright likable. Um, there are people who enjoy her and like her and can relate to her, but um, there are some people who loathe Clem Jasper in, in Driftwood. Um, and when I get bad reviews on, say, Amazon or my least favorite website, Goodreads, um, people will say that they hate Clem, and that's why they give it a bad well, review. Well, that's so stupid. That means you did your job well. That's exactly what I'm thinking. I thought, well, <laughs> shit, I won. Like, exactly. I made you hate her. You know um, what? I, I don't find her unlikable. I find her to be someone who... Um, speaks her mind and doesn't speak shit. Right. No, I want I want to read a little excerpt from from the first chapter where yeah. she describes her sister. And it doesn't sound like she hates her sister or anything. It just sounds like she's a matter of fact. So, here's a little excerpt. So, my sister Dina is what some would classify as a serious environmentalist. She is not. She is a commercial illusion of environmentalist. She has a Keep Tahoe Blue sticker on the back of an SUV, a $55 canvas grocery tote made in Malaysian sweatshop. A smiling granola lover unaware of her oversized clown shoed carbon footprint. I think that's just hilarious when I read that. There's more to it. It keeps going on and it's amazing. But I just related to that so much and it's basically I feel like she says what we think. You know? Right. It, it's I, find, I find her to be a likable character in that sense. I, I liked that part of her as well and I, I found that like what I wanted to do stylistically with the book is to um, kind of convey because it is in the first person for Clem that she's sort of she's very she has these observations she listens to a lot of people but she herself is very controlled emotionally and she doesn't let a lot out um, and I wanted everything to be kind of tight and, and not a lot of wiggle room she makes these little sly comments here and there um, but she's not fully open and that doesn't really happen for some time um, and so it was sort of a tightrope walk with her in order to make her an interesting character, but at the same time, um, you know, not quite give everything away about her. But I think a lot of people get turned off by the fact that here she has all these resources and chooses not to take advantage of them. Um, but I know, I know a lot of people like that. So um, it was you know, some of the stuff is modeled off of people that I've met. I was going to ask you, how, how much do you pull from your own life, and is there a lot in there that you've kind of disguised? Um, not so much. In fact, a lot of people have said to me, well, are you Clem? And I think I'm the furthest from Clem. I'm, I'm nothing like her. If anything, I'm sort of more akin to Tommy. Um, I really loved taking on his voice and writing his letters, and that was the most comfortable for me. And I would like to ask, uh, I'm currently starting a book. Um, so uh, as someone who is looking to get their, well, potentially looking to get their book published rather than going down the self-publishing route, right. what kind of advice would you give for someone that's looking to approach publishers? Um, well, the first thing you need to do is get an agent. And um, it's a terrible, painful stupid absolutely stupid process and I'm sorry agents <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry Honestly. that I said that um, I had an agent in in Scotland and it didn't work out because for a while I thought that I would live in Scotland and when it, I moved it just transatlantic it didn't quite work um, so he and I parted ways and then I became sort of this free agent I have a tendency to not do things the way that you're supposed to do them. And another so... Thing relate on. Huh? Another, thing, th another thing I can relate to you with. Another thing. Same I mean, if, if it's not supposed to be done that way, I have a tendency to do it. Um, and so, without an agent, um, I, you know, was sort of flying blind. The general consensus is that you get this agent, and then the agent's got to hustle for you. They've got to go around, sell this book, um, 
to a publisher and then it moves forward from there. I think Maybe that's... Maybe a better question is how do you approach an agent then that will hopefully help you get a book published? This, I think, is one of the biggest problems that we have as authors um, is that you have to transition from your creative self to your business self. Mm -hmm. And you, in essence, have to sell yourself in this query letter. And I am the world's worst salesperson. Apparently I don't, not. <laughs> I don't care. I'm just like, whatever. You want it? You don't want it? What do I care? Um, See, you know what? You've got hard. that attitude, though. It's the attitude of, eh, I don't care. And then someone's like, oh, I want that. You know right. what I mean? It's like I the person that doesn't want you, but then like you want them. <laughs> I wanted, <laughs> like, I wanted, to, I wanted to be published so badly, but then I thought, you know, I'm going to write no matter what. I've always written. I've written since I was little. I wrote terrible books for my family as a small child, and we get really frustrated when they didn't understand them um, because they made no sense. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I didn't have an agent, and then. Um, I just, I was very, very lucky. I, uh, some, the, some of the people at this publishing house, Skyhorse, had read some humor columns of, humor essays of mine. And they approached me with the title of a book, 1,033 Reasons to Smile. And I thought, well, that's not really my, my kind of gig, but tell me more. And um, they said, well, we have a title and everything else is up to you. <laughs> okay. Um, at the time that it came to me, um, oh, people! <laughs> right? I was like, mm, good guidance, like that. Um, I was having such a hard time. I was at a really low point in my life, and um, it was—I mean, I was just suffering from terrible depression and just had like sort of fallen apart. And this is handed to me, and I thought, okay, this is an opportunity to get published. Um, so I had to force myself to write 20 things because they had gave me such a short period of time. It was in January of that year. And they said, can we get the draft by May 1st? And I was like, do I have to do 1,033? And they said, well, ballpark it, you know, 300 will work. I'm thinking now as the child of an attorney, my mom's a lawyer. I thought I'm going to get sued. I'm totally going to get sued for not having enough. So I have like a disclaimer at the beginning, like, well, you may have more, you may have less. Um, so what I forced myself to do is write 20 things that made me smile every day. And that kind of pulled me out of this funk. It no gave kidding. me something to like, all of a sudden I thought, okay, wait a second. This is making me really happy. It was also a challenge because once you get through the sort of surface, like what's going to make you smile, then I had to come at it from all these different directions. Um, and so it sounds like a self-help book, but it's really, it's very silly. And um, it is, it's just sort of random list, you know, you can just put it out there. Um, so that one came to sort of as a fluke and it did really Yeah, well. but you put yourself out there though. You were doing columns and stuff. So that that's why I think that you say it just came to you. But at the same time, it's not that you were just sitting down doing nothing, not writing and someone came to you. You were well, doing I, something because that's a lesson for people. But do. what's odd, it wasn't even do. a published essay. It was this oh, bizarre essay I'd written about taking a boat trip with my family and and like it was like a Audubon Society boat trip and everyone on the boat got sick. And it was very descriptive. <laughs> um, and that's what they liked about it. Well, fine, nice. you know? And so I wrote the book. And then they said to me, do you have a novel? And I said, I sure do. And um, then they've uh, they've just updated a thousand. They asked me for some more. So a thousand forty-seven reasons to smile, which just got picked up by Urban Outfitters. Interesting. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. That'll Thank be great. You. Thank oh, you. Wow, this so, is awesome. You know, if you want to stop in and get like a dream catcher and like, you know, an ironic t shirt. I don't really go in there, but I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to take a picture. If I, next time I'm near it, I'm going to take a picture and send it to you. I'll just be like, Yay! I love that. I love when people send me pictures. Yeah, that'd be really, of fun. That'd be really fun. I have, that's awesome. Really Are you ready for 20 uh, questions? Hell yes, I'm ready for 20 questions. All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Coffee or tea? Uh, tea. Meat or veggies? Vegetables. Good for you. TV or Netflix? Uh, Netflix. Twitter or Facebook? Instagram. Oh, she threw that at us. Yoga or yogurt? I really like both of them. <laughs> um, I like Greek yogurt 
But I like yoga. Let's go yoga. I can say like eating yogurt while doing yoga. Someone That's said a that good before. one. Okay. <laughs> Mainlining yo- Greek yogurt <laughs> while doing yoga. Nice. <laughs> Friends or Seinfeld? Yeah, I really, I really wasn't a fan of, I not like a fan fan, but I didn't really watch either. Um, <sighs> I don't know. For Ross, I'd say, represents Friends. I represent Seinfeld. So you're breaking yeah. both our hearts. Am All right, we'll, your heart? we'll move forward with that one. California or South Carolina? California. I kind of consider myself, people here will say I'm a Yankee, and I say, no, I'm from Planet California. <laughs> uh, I consider myself a Californian, like sort of first and foremost. Like I hate to say this, not that I'm not patriotic, but before an American, I'm a Californian, and it's I was a fifth generation um, Californian before I moved, which is sort of a rare thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Usually, and, crazy people like me decide to move out to California. Yeah, well, California is crazy because it's populated by crazy people. My family. <laughs> My family got there for the gold rush. You got to be nuts. So like one of my ancestors got on the boat in France, pregnant and gave birth on the boat on the way to the gold rush. Oh my rush. gosh, that's crazy. You got to be so nuts. I, I was that. just, I was just in LA and we, we went to one of the museums and heard about the gold rush and everything. So that's crazy that they were part of that. Yeah. That's it's crazy. And so they're crazy. You got to be crazy to go there. And so <laughs> From we have the very a long beginning. tradition. Yeah. A long tradition of crazy. Beginning. And so I identify <laughs> with that. Although I do love, I like South Carolina and love the slow pace and everyone's yeah. so sweet. Yeah. Education or experience? Experience. Wow. And you're a teacher. I know, right? Shh, don't tell my kids. <laughs> well, I say kids. I teach college. My college experience you know, I learned things in the classroom, but so much of what I learned was just meeting other people and exactly. exchanging ideas. And so I wouldn't trade experience for the world. And I regret this a, nothing. This is an interesting one for you. Words or photographs? Words. Well, of course. This is an brainer <laughs> <laughs> I do love photographs. I love, love photographs, but I'm a words person. Yeah. Canada or Scotland? Scotland. Forever. Baseball or football? Baseball. Oakland A's baseball. <laughs> Style or substance? Substance. Good. The Smiths or Morrissey? That is so unfair. <laughs> oh, I'm going to say Smiths. I'm going to say Smith. Oh, this is like breaking my heart. Um, <laughs> I think you made the right decision. Yeah, I'm going to say Smiths on that yeah. one. You, you made a good choice. Stick to it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Breaking Bad or Orange is the New Black? I have not watched either. Oh, what's your favorite Netflix show right now? Um, my favorite next Netflix show, in fact, I was going to mention it because we were talking about um, current, like, what do you like right now? Yeah. Um, there is this show called The Detectorists. Oh, I get that. Yeah, that's popped up. It's just new, isn't it? Is it good? Yeah. It's good. It's really good because it's very sort of, it's it's funny and it's kind of sweet, but it's got a really great theme song by this guy, um, Johnny Flynn. And so I really like his work, um, but I like that one. Michael Jackson or Michael Bolton? I'm going to go with Michael Bolton, but not, oh, no but way. hold up, hold up. Not, 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 not the Michael Bolton, the oh. singer, Michael Bolton from the movie Office Space. Okay. I haven't seen that in years. Okay. She just blew her mind. She threw that at us. She stuck it to <laughs> us, man. It's still Michael Bolton, but it's not the singer. True. It's True. the character. <laughs> Celine Dion or Marilyn Manson? <laughs> <laughs> that is such an amazing comparison. Um, I'm going to say Marilyn Manson. Yeah. I don't know why. I see. I, get, I become a whole different person. So talking about Marilyn Manson, I'm like, yeah! Like, so, like, there's like a section of music that I love that is like the kind of music where it's like a gut punch. Like you feel like you've yeah. been like punched in the face and are spitting out teeth. Yep. And then you need that every now and then. Oh, like yeah. I love, like, I love the Pogues. I love, um, I love this. There's a San Francisco punk band that's been around forever, Swing and Utters. Adore. Um, Murder City Devils is another one that's kind of like that. I like Brody Doll and all the stuff that she's done. So 
I would I would kind of put it in with that. Sometimes you need that kind of. Oh, you need it. And I really don't ever need Dion. So. Sorry, <laughs> Celine. <laughs> Ricky Gervais. <laughs> we'll go on. She'll be fine without me. It's okay. <laughs> Ricky Gervais or Ricky Martin? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to say Ricky Martin. And really? the only reason I'm saying that is that when my grandmother in her final years um, was not quite all there and she was in a special home and she suddenly became enamored of Ricky Martin. And here was a very sort of like progressive... Um, you know, very liberal woman um, and, and an incredible intellectual. I mean, probably the most read, well-read person I ever, ever knew. And one day I went to go see her and she said, you have to watch this, you have to watch this. And it was Ricky Martin. And she said, just look at the way his butt moves. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the craziest thing I've ever seen. And so that's, yeah, that, I think that was in her all along, though. <laughs> yeah, I think she was like, it had to have like, been in her all along. <laughs> I'm glad Sweet. that she didn't, you know, like, didn't live to have her heart broken. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I would I say I love Ricky Gervais. That's He's a little good. bit mean, but yeah, I can be kind of mean myself. So maybe it's just, you know, you don't like in other people what you have in yourself. Quail or kale? I would say a whale made out of kale. Oh, hmm. that would be a lot of kale. I would definitely put that in, kale my, in my morning I can see that like in the Saatchi, you know, I like like a, like a really great gallery show <laughs> of like giant creatures made out of kale. Maybe they'll, they'll come along a really uh, fantastic Bridge Atlantic uh, fan who's an artist and they can do, they can make our dream come true okay. and make a whale out of kale. Well, what if they that made it fantastic. out of kale and then you use like, you use like maritime lacquer, I'm not <laughs> using the term correctly, but like a heavy shellac. <laughs> <laughs> get in the whale and float around in the kale whale. Oh, oh, because as long as it's not a real whale. Like a motor and just like <laughs> motor up to like a marina and be like, Ridiculous. ahoy, I'm Ridiculous. in a kale whale. Ridiculous. Bet Midler or the Riddler? Oh my God, Bet Midler. Nice. And your final question, the most important question you will ever be asked in the next five minutes <laughs> Ross or Marcio? Um. Can I love you equally, like children? Yes. Well, no one, no parent loves their child completely equally, even if they say that they do. <laughs> yeah, I know. My brother's the favorite in the family, and I'm I, okay I, with that. This has been great. Where can everyone find you online? Um, ElizabethDutton.com uh, is one place. Um, I'm on Facebook. I have an author page on Facebook that receives a wonderful number of lewd messages on a regular basis. Oh, that's author Elizabeth it, Dutton. Yeah, it just if you just Google or not Google, but Facebook search Elizabeth Dutton, it'll be on there. And uh, um, on Twitter, you're Dutton Writes. So it's Dutton D U T T O N W R I T. Right. I had to change my Twitter handle. I had I had an old Twitter handle, as you well know. Yeah. And then um, I accident well not accidentally I posted a pro Black Lives Matter tweet, and then all the white supremacists came after me. And then they started like finding out, trying to figure out where I lived and stuff. And oh, so dear. I closed the account and started another. That's weird. You just delete. Just you just block them. All you got to you don't have to close. It. Just block them. Clean time. slate. I just clean That's slated. It. Yeah. That's it. Because I was as, blocking them, but it was like whack a mole. They just kept coming. Yeah. Ugh. yeah. That's not cool. As for me, I'm working on my next solo album, and you can hear my music at marcinovelli.com. Watch my new music video for my song Remember Love at youtube.com slash music. I've also recently released my award-winning documentary Walking Proof, which chronicles the making of my debut solo album, and you can watch it for free at marcinovelli.com slash walkingproof. Um, all of those websites, by the way, except for the YouTube, were designed by... Ross Barber here. Uh, make sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, which are all at Marcio Novelli. And I'm nice. working on websites for our various artists just now. I'm also working on my first book, which is terrifying and exciting. And you can check out my work at electrickiwi.co.uk. You'll find me on Twitter and Instagram as Electric Kiwi and on Facebook, Electric Kiwi Design. This episode was brought to you by Chris Keaton Presents. Find out more about what Chris does and how he can help you at chriskeaton.com. If you like to sponsor the show, visit patreon.com slash bridge the Atlantic. Awesome, Elizabeth. This has been so great. I'm so glad that we can finally set this up. So, uh, yeah, come back, okay? I had a blast. You can have me back anytime you like.
Thanks for watching Bridge the Atlantic. If you like what you saw, make sure to like, favorite, and most importantly, subscribe so that you don't miss each week's episode. Please feel free to leave us a comment letting us know what you think of the show. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and subscribe to us on iTunes so that you can listen to us on the go. Thanks again for being awesome, and we'll see you on next week's episode. Awesome.